The other day, I had a really interesting conversation with a good friend who's a wonderfully successful composer, but they're just a little bit less knowledgeable about the production side of things. And weeks before this conversation, I'd actually given them advice about mixing and mastering a piece of music so that it could sound as polished as possible, just like on a soundtrack album that's ready for release. Now they wanted to know if they could apply the exact same plugins and practices that I had just shown them for when they're mixing and preparing music stems for the dub stage on a film that they were scoring. The answer to this was a definite no, and so I made this video because I wanted to help illustrate why it's so important to consider these different points when producing your music for different applications. Make sure that you stick around until the end of this video because my friend actually made a huge mistake, which caused them to have to reprint all of their stems and tracks on a really tight deadline. And I don't want that to happen to you, so we're going to talk about it towards the end. Let's dive in. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is working around dialogue and sound effects. When you're working with story and dialogue is present, what the characters are saying is typically gonna be the most important thing from a sound perspective. So you wanna keep this in mind when you're choosing the instrumentation and the size of your arrangement. That way the music doesn't overpower what's being said on the screen. You also wanna keep this in mind when it comes to mixing your cues. On the final mixing stage, your music is not gonna play back at what's called unity or it's default fault volume. So when referencing my music to a scene, I'm gonna create what the dub stage mixer will do by lowering my master bus by at least five or 10 decibels. And this way, I can sort of like approximate how everything is gonna play underneath the dialogue. If musically there's something that's either like too busy or again, it's fighting with the frequencies of the voices, I'm gonna mix those elements down so that they're not as distracting. However, when I do a soundtrack version of this same exact cue, these rules are often gonna be reversed. So if there's something happening that's like really interesting musically, but maybe I mixed it down because it felt a little bit busy under dialogue, then in the soundtrack version, I'm free to raise the volume so that the piece is more interesting to the listener. This is important to keep in mind because now the focus isn't the dialogue. The focus instead is 100% on the music. It has to be able to stand on its own rather than playing a supporting role to the picture. Keeping this in mind, the next things that we're going to consider are the accents and the musical effects. So when writing a cue for film and TV, there's a lot of moments that might occur on screen where the creative team want like a big accent. For example, maybe something's happening that's meant to shock or surprise the audience, or it's something that a director or showrunner wants people to really notice or pay attention to for the sake of the story. And so they ask you sometimes to do something that brings attention to that moment. And I have entire folders that are dedicated to accents, and they can go from something as subtle as like a strange string gesture like this, to like a really big drum hit or whoosh that's more like this. How big and bold the accent is really sort of depends on the project and the type of score and the degree to which the creative team really wants the music to comment on these sort of things. So with that being said, if you were to take this cue, for example, and put it in your portfolio to use for a pitch or add it to a soundtrack album that gets released for a project, the listener typically has no reference for why an accent might be placed where it is, especially if it's not placed in a musical way. This then interrupts the musical experience experience and it doesn't really make sense because the content of your cue has now changed from a supporting role where there's picture and dialogue and special effects to now the music being consumed without any accompaniment. That's why whenever I create a soundtrack version or a portfolio version for my cue, I make sure that they play back appropriately for the intended experience. So if there's an accent in there that just doesn't make sense when you're listening to the piece on its own, I'll either lower it drastically in the mix or I'll just take it out entirely. Because in my mind, you're always serving the audience. And so when the way someone experiences your music changes, it's my personal opinion that you should adjust your tracks accordingly and have the music make sense without the accompaniment of the story in the picture. So I want you to keep this in mind as we move on to my next point, which is the arrangement and the structure. 
When it comes to arrangement and structure, it's really common for there to be long scenes where your cue may begin with like very thin pads that then evolve to a fuller arrangement. And because of everything that's happening on screen with the story slowly unfolding, the viewers likely engaged in the minimal building of music could work really, really well. When you convert that to a soundtrack version, or even more importantly, you use it in your portfolio for a pitch, it's likely gonna need to be edited so that the listener stays interested and engaged. There's now no picture, no characters, no story or dialogue. Oftentimes what I do is I'll just cut out entire sections so that the track sort of gets to the point more quickly. This is especially important when you're pitching for a new project because sometimes executives will only listen to a track for like no more than 10 seconds. And truthfully, it can be even less before they decide that they're gonna skip or continue listening. And so it's really important that in these cases, you get to the point quickly. I would not recommend having the mindset of a purist, where you feel that the track has to play back exactly as it did in the film or series. Me personally, I always want to give my music the best chance it has to be heard and experienced. And so this is another change that I'll make when taking a cue from a project to repurposing it for a pitch or a soundtrack version. This brings me to my last tip, which is number four, mastering. This is where we're gonna discuss that critical mistake that my friend made and it caused them to have to redo a ton of work. One of the biggest differences between my cue mixes and my soundtrack mixes is the application of mastering tools. When it comes to delivering cues to the mix stage for a film or television series, there really should be no mastering plugins whatsoever used on the stem buses or your master bus. More specifically, I'm really referring to avoiding using what's called a limiter or a maximizer. So what my friend did was they put a popular mastering plugin called Ozone with a maximizer on the master bus of all of their cues and they printed all of their stems through that master bus for final delivery. Every stem ended up having a maximizer on it and this was a big learning experience because the reason they did this was that a few weeks prior they were doing a pitch, they were not scoring a scene to an actual picture, but they were just delivering an audio file. And they wanted their track to sound better, so this plugin definitely helped them achieve that. But now that the track was being used in a completely different context as we've discussed, it's really not good to use those types of plugins. And here's why I wouldn't recommend using a limiter or maximizer when delivering cues for a project like that. To give you a very basic explanation of these tools, limiters and maximizers are typically the last tools in your mastering chain and they are specifically designed to increase the perceived loudness of a track. However, when doing that, that it sort of creates like a ceiling that the WAV file cannot go past and this in turn limits what you can do to that audio file after the plugin has been applied. So this is the reason that these plugins are used as again the very last plugin in a chain during the mastering process because after they're applied you will drastically lose the ability to edit an audio file without getting noticeable distortion or unwanted artifacts that just don't sound right. With that tech talk sort of out of the way, here's what you need to know. For film and television or video games, your mix is not the final adjustment to the music. After it leaves your studio, it's gonna go to the mix stage and it's gonna get blended with all the other audio files that are part of the project. So that could include like dialogue, sound effects, and so on. And because this mix stage engineer may want to make changes or adjustments, you don't want to literally limit their capabilities when it comes to your music tracks. So on the other hand, when these exact same cues are being used for a soundtrack version or they're being used in your portfolio or on your website, I highly recommend that you use a limiter or master on your track. Because as we discussed in this context, your music needs to stand on its own and mastering is an important part of creating a well-produced track. In this case, your mastering plugin is going to be the end of the line for adjustments to the track. No one else is gonna be tweaking or adding EQ or anything, and so applying a limiter or a maximizer 
is gonna be the best way to get a piece of music to play back consistently across many different listening devices like headphones or stereo speakers, monitors, listening in your car, and so on. As composers, we tend to spend so much time focused on music and notes that these more technical details can get lost. However, these are really important things to be aware of, so I hope that you found this information valuable. Please share this with other music creators or composers if you feel that it's gonna help them as well. And also, if you can hit the like button and subscribe, it allows me to continue making free content just like this. I've really been enjoying seeing people's responses to these videos, so please feel free to comment below, especially if you have any questions or suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover. If you would also like some free virtual instruments or to learn about composing on major film and television projects, just head over to modernmediacomposer.com. It's my educational website where you can sign up on the homepage. We have tons of awesome releases planned, including my first free virtual instrument called Tension Pads, which you can pick up today. I appreciate you taking the time to check this video out, and as always, I hope it's been helpful.